Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I can progress this myself. Right, there's, my, there's my, my opening slide. You see the title at the bottom. What will it take to get from here, the unsatisfactory present, to there? And it's very interesting. You've heard a lot of input about what there ought to look like. I want to especially point your attention to, to, to Ron Clark's school. That's an important part of there, except we've got to scale it at a huge level across the country. Now, I just want to tell you something about that title. It came from a commercial many years ago that really struck me and a lot of other people. This guy is in, in upstate Vermont trying to get to an obscure address in an obscure town, Brattleboro or something, right? And it's late at night, it's really dark, and he pulls into a gas station. It is raining and sleeting. And this, this Vermont, this old-time Vermont guy, comes out, puts gas in his car. And when he comes to the window to get the credit card, the guy says to him, I'm trying to get to this address in Brattleboro. How do I do it? And the guy looks at the address, looks at the guy, who was clearly from New York, looks back at the address, and he says, Brattleboro. You can't get there from here. You've heard that. You've heard that line. Bet you didn't know where it came from. It came from that commercial, as far as I know. Now, that really struck me as having a lot to do with the kind of work that I do. There's, there, there are problems in American education that make it very difficult to get there from here. And that's what I came to talk to you about today. Let me put it in context for you. Here's a vision of, of there, the big there. Our vision is a nation dedicated to producing successive generations of citizens, one after another that does it for the next, that does it for the next, prepared to constructively participate in the society of their time. Now, that's the hard part, because things are changing so fast that it's a tall order to get kids from here to there where we don't even really understand what there's going to be like right? Big challenge. What will it take to get there? We've got to understand how mindsets are crucial to the kind of collective action that we need to take to get from here to there. Now, I'm going to give you two alternative mindsets and ask you to figure out which one is likely to get us. I'm going to ask you to figure out which one characterizes the way you've been raised and which one is the kind of mindset we need to get from here to there. The first one, this is number one, is the innate ability model or mindset. See if you recognize this. The color is sickly green. What does it take to get people developed enough to function in the 21st century? Oh, before I do that, let me ask you, let me do a, a quick call and response. I'm going to give the call, and you're going to give the response, but give it enthusiastically if you know the answer. You ready? Some got it, and? A lot of you knew the answer to that, didn't you? Now, I'm going to make the case that you folks are part of the problem. That's deadly knowledge that you have. Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so what is it that leads to development? How do you get people to 21st century levels? In this mindset, the answer is actually quite simple and, and very powerful. Some got it, and those who got it can develop, those what don't can't. This is a profound belief system that affects institutional operations. To wit, teachers who believe this Human resource professionals who believe this will tend to organize people in groups according to how much they got. The top group, the group that's considered to go far, are called VSs, which would stand for what? Take a guess. Very smart. These are the people that learn and learn fast and can be expected to rise to much higher levels than they currently occupy. The second group, about a third of first graders, Okay, first group is a third, second group is a third. Our SSs, which would stand for sort of smart. 
they can learn stuff, but not as fast, and they can't learn as much as the VSs can. And then there's the third group. Say it loud. <laughs> the bluebirds, the robins, and the sparrows. The jet, real teachers use this, the jet planes, the trains, and the buses. Fast, medium, and slow reading and math groups. Okay? And by the way, the same thing applies in adult institutions. High potentials, medium potentials, low potentials. People actually, corporate people, raise your hands. There are potentials ratings in most American businesses whereby people are rated in exactly the same way. In the innate ability paradigm, it's understood that human characteristics are innate endowments, get this, fixed at birth, distributed unequally among the population. What's the shape? And distributed unequally among different population groups. Some groups got it and some groups Um, it applies with particular force to intelligence. Now get this. The unequal distribution of mental ability is understood to, by people who believe this, who bought into this system, is understood to be the cause of the wide variation we see in human intellectual performance and development. You see differences in outcomes. We assume differences in input and in intelligence going in. This assumption results in the tendency, a powerful tendency we have to judge people. We measure their intelligence, we make judgments about their learning potentials, and then we determine their possibilities for life based on those measures. And if you don't believe me, think about the last time you had a family reunion, and think about the way that the relatives think about you and your cousin group. My suspicion is they got you in a hierarchy, okay? based on who's a doctor and a lawyer and an Indian chief versus who's pumping gas. And what goes along with that is judgments they make about the intellectual capacities of different people in that hierarchy, where you yourself fit somewhere in that hierarchy. This is a very common sort of understanding and belief system in America. Now, that's one. Here's two. We call this the get smart model of development. And the color code here is true blue. In this model, development is based on, understand that, think through the differences here, effective effort, not innate ability. Effective effort defined as tenacious engagement at a task, where you don't give up, especially in the face of difficulty, tenacity. A powerful focus on feedback, where you take the data about how you're doing, and you analyze that data, and you make it information that tells you what it is. Now get this, this is the definition of feedback. What I must work on to improve. That is always available if you analyze the data from your performance, especially after failure. And then, based on that analysis, the answer to that question, what, what must I work on, you're in a position to put together a strategy to gather the knowledge you need to do better at that task. Now, here's our position, our fundamental position. People who believe that, who understand how to do that, can learn just about anything in the 21st century gifted and talented curriculum and can go on to be lifelong learners. So the question is, why is it that some people can give you effective effort and so many others cannot or do not? And the answer is, I'm a social psychologist by training, the answer is there's a social psychological variable that controls effort. Those who believe they can do it are the ones who can work at it. And those who work will learn. And when they learn, what does that do for their confidence? Okay? Going to the next round, even more confident, which puts them in a position to put more effective effort in higher levels of development, more confidence. So you wind up getting, for these people who believe in this model, who've internalized this model, you get an upward spiral of confidence, effort, and development that really has no bounds. 
That's how development actually works. And all of you who are good at stuff, really good at something, this characterizes how you got there. But there's a problem with this model. This model works in reverse. Take a second and see if you can figure out how this would work in reverse. If you undercut someone's confidence, you undercut simultaneously their capacity to put effective effort into the learning. If they don't work, they don't learn. What does that do for their confidence? So you set up a downward spiral. And that's the spiral that characterizes many, many, many of the children in our schools today. But I want to dwell on the upward spiral part of that, because that's what's going to lead us to some sort of promised land. Some got it and some don't. Innate ability controls development, very smart, sort of smart, kind of dumb. Does that ring any bells for you? Anybody? Does it feel correct to you? All right, that was my lead-in <laughs> to alternative two. So you just saw alternative two. Now, so the alternative two is, is confidence leads to effective effort leads to development, okay? So let's talk about alternative two, the get smart mindset. In the get smart mindset, it's understood that virtually everybody is capable of brilliance. Virtually not everybody, but virtually everybody. Important human characteristics are neither fixed nor given. Capabilities are built over time through the action of effective effort on the brain. Very quickly, I want to show you something. When people work in a sustained fashion at very challenging tasks, the brain responds to that physically, physiologically, by putting together powerful neural networks associated with the skill that's being worked on. But get this, when people don't work hard at something that's challenging, when they give up, no neural network development. With regard to intellectual development, it's understood in this mindset that virtually all of our children are born with enough mental capacity to get to that gifted and talented curriculum that Ron is trying to get his kids to, that he was teaching all of his kids to. The reason they could do it is that virtually everybody is born with that. Implications of Get Smart capabilities, unlike innate fixed abilities, capabilities can be developed throughout life. People can actually become more intelligent through the application of effort. Again, all of you who are good at stuff, you know that this is true. You got good at the things you kept working at. You did not get good at the stuff that you quit. When effort is mobilized rather than debilitated, and all the great teachers have learned this, they know how to mobilize their children's effort, people can control the pace and direction of development. If you got a great teacher, you got a fast class. By halfway through the first semester, everybody's moving like that. Failure and difficulty, really important, can stimulate mobilized effort when it's understood as feedback about what to do to improve. The great teachers use failure. They cultivate failure to teach their kids to make feedback, to figure out what to work on, and then come up with a strategy. And through that process, kids learn that they can do it, and failure never discombobulates them. Failure debilitates effort only when it's used as a basis for judgment about the innate limitations of the individual, which happens in most American classrooms. So, I've given you two ideas about the nature of intelligence. Idea number one, intelligence is innate, fixed at birth, and unequally distributed. Some got it and some don't. Idea two, people can develop intelligence through sustained application of effective effort at challenging tasks. That is especially true when they learn to use their failures as feedback about what to work on to improve, and they put a strategy together to do that. So keep number one and number two in mind as we go through a little application exercise. Which mindset would be better? 
for a classroom teacher who is under pressure to move all of his or her students to very high levels of academic proficiency. Which one would be better, one or two? Which would be better as a cultural underpinning by a principal, the mindset of a principal who's just come into an underperforming school, which would be better as a cultural underpinning for that principal for turning around that school, one or two? Which would be more important for parents to have, to empower them to powerfully play constructive roles in pushing their kids' development? Would you want those parents to be one or two? Which would be important for elevating the self-concept of a despised, underrepresented, trod-upon population group in a society? Would you want them to learn, number one, to help them sort of get their self-concept up, or would you have them learn number two? Which would be better to put the mayor and other community leaders in a position to, to truly mobilize a community, let's say Atlanta, uh, to really, truly transform public education? Would you have the mayor believe one or two? Which would be better for building an educational program that will return the country to economic preeminence? One or two? Now, you were doing two at a level that was almost monotonous. You were like, two, 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 two. They ask you a question. Which one do you think is dominant in American schools today? One or two? Which one do you think is dominant in American culture in general? One or two? Let me take it a step further than that, and let me tell you, one has been the dominant belief system in America about the nature and distribution of intelligence throughout almost all of the, of the 20th century and into the 21st. It is so profoundly believed by most Americans that the way we think about it is, it's like it's in the water. And if you drink the water of American culture, you know the answer to the call out, some got it and some don't. You know it because you've known it your whole lives, because it's in the water. So, what's it going to take to turn this whole thing around? I'm going to offer a three-part process that we use in working with underperforming schools and we think needs to be happening in the society as a whole. First, you've got to build consensus among people in general about what the mission is of public education. We suggest to you that the mission has to be academic proficiency or higher and strong character for all of our kids. Second, you've got to change the mindset, okay? That underlying belief system. You've got to change the mindset to a belief that people can, in fact, get smart. You have to establish the belief that effort, not innate ability, is the basis for development for both children and adults. And third, you've got to install some sort of a method. I don't have time to go into it, but we teach people to use data to drive changes in their teaching strategies, their instructional approach, so that they can actually move the needle and move their kids to much higher levels of proficiency. Now, of those three things, the one in the middle is truly the one in the middle. You can't get to number one unless you do number two. You can't get to number three until you've already done number two. You have to change the mindset to drive any kind of reform process. Changing the mindset. You got to build belief that the mission can be accomplished. You got to deal with the doubts that are pervasive in American culture. Leaders have to directly confront the crisis in confidence about our ability to achieve proficiency. They have to build confidence in the capacities of children to achieve it at high levels. And we haven't talked about this. Leaders have to build confidence in the abilities of the adults that manage our children to help them do so. We've got to make everybody understand that effort is the key. To achieve this mission of moving all of our kids to proficiency, we have to fundamentally alter the American mindset about intelligence and learning capacity. That's the big job in front of us, people. The current belief system that some have it and some don't, that is so pervasive in American culture, represents a you-can't-get-there-from-here proposition. If you believe that, 
You can't get to Ron's school. Lots of well-intentioned reform attempts, like increasing learning time, which is the latest one, or moving to smaller schools, which was the one before that, or getting all teachers to use the best practices that are given to us by our schools of education. These are all good ideas. In fact, they are probably necessary ideas, but I want to suggest to you that they're not sufficient and they're not going to get the job done now any more than they have over the last 35 or 40 years of education reform. They amount to putting the cart before the horse. A profound cultural shift to the get smart mindset in society and in our schools is the absolute prerequisite for building the kind of educational system that our kids and our nation need to thrive in the 21st century. It's the, it's the horse that's going to drive the change. Now, I want you to get this. This is a charge to all of us who care about education. I want to propose to you that it's those of us who believe in our children's learning capacities who have the responsibility to, to, to figure out on a massive social scale how to get the rest of us to believe it too. Ron operating by himself at a local level can do wonders in that building. But if we're going to take that building and make it an example that we can take to scale, we're going to have to change the mindset of American culture, and I believe it can be done. Thank you for your attention.